would love to uh, introduce Lisa Dusso, the CTO of DTI, um, and take it away. Um, I'd like to welcome up to the table here our next um, set of academic speakers. Um, I will introduce them briefly and then hand the show off to them until it's time for questions. Um, we'll first have Joe Jerome um, uh, talking about immersive reality and uh, portability. Um, Cornelia Kuterer. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, the French slips out sometimes um, with uh, work on um, very personalized AIs and challenges that will eventually pose. And Chan, uh, Rajendra Nicolucci talking about uh, real time and continuous and the technical solutions that are possible for that kind of thing. Awesome. Uh so I'm, I think I'm the only person that has a presentation. Hi, everybody. I'm Joe. Um, if I start ranting and raving too long, give me a nice little nudge. Um, in any event, I'm here to talk about uh, data portability and immersive technologies. Um, I always think it's important in these instances uh, to give a, uh, I, I'm, it's easy to forget this, but I, I really do want to thank uh, Chris, Delara, and DTI for giving me an opportunity to write about this. Um, I've been working in technology policy for a long time, um, dabbled in data portability when I was at the Center for Democracy and Technology, and it's always an issue I haven't really worked on as much as I would have liked, and it's a little itch that's in the back of my mind whenever there's a tech policy issue, um, and none more so uh, than immersive technologies. Um, I previously, in another life, worked uh, on the policy team at Meta's Reality Labs unit. Um, and we sort of viewed our mission then as to make the world ready for the metaverse. I'm not here to talk about the metaverse, but I am here to talk about components of that. Um, and that includes things like augmented reality, virtual reality headsets, and just more immersive technologies. And, and I continue to be very, very bullish about the opportunity and potential of these new technologies. Um, you know, two years ago, it was the buzzword that's everywhere, but even today, we still have Apple announcing with its Vision Pro the dawn of the era of spatial computing. There's a lot of companies um, still working on these technologies. Technologies. And, and if this is the future internet, um, I'd like to see it with a little bit more portability baked in. Um, so, well, I guess uh, let's start with the, the, the notion that um, a lot of these immersive technologies are very, very data hungry. Um, they take existing sources of data uh, and use that information in exciting and new ways. And they also leverage entirely new forms of data. So this is a little screenshot um, of, a, of a sort of a very high-level taxonomy of XR data from a report that self-plug I authored with the, the Future of Privacy Forum in 2021. Um, this gets expanded to, uh, in 2023, a report from the NYU Center for Business and Human Rights uh, really distilled my initial taxonomy. Now we're talking about inward-facing and outward-facing sensor information. Um, FPF continues to be really engaged in understanding the data flows of immersive technologies. I take no credit for this, but it's a gorgeous graphic that highlights just the complexity of all of the data here. Um, and what does this mean? Uh, that, that is from the Future of Privacy Forum. Uh, this leads to the Washington Post uh, talking about how the Apple Vision Pro is the most data-hungry gadget it's ever seen. Um, so. As a privacy attorney, that's my background, a lot of this gives, all of this new data processing gives me huge privacy nightmares. Um, but the reason I'm excited to be here today is that I think the, all of this technology also offers tremendous new opportunities um, for data portability. Uh, with respect to the metaverse and a lot of these technologies, interoperability has been a, has been in, like a buzzword since day one. Um, this comes directly from Snow Crash, where the term metaverse comes from. But the idea is we're going to have a future internet that is open and interoperable. I think we're a long, long way from that. Uh, and so as a result, let's just start with data portability. Um, and so the paper that I worked on for DTI focuses on two types of data in particular, um, spatial maps and avatars. Uh, and my argument is generally that XR companies should be making much more of this information available to users, 
um, under portability and access rights, but frankly, also, it should just be more available to developers in the wider community. Um, Avatars and spatial data highlight where I think there's already a lot of good cross-industry uh, motivation to work on these issues. Um, so part of my thesis is the scaffolding for data portability is already here. Uh, and I think that you know these data types are just a useful place to start because I think they do have tremendous amounts of utility um, for third-party app developers um, and platforms. Um, so let's start. What are spatial maps? Uh, spatial maps are the technical foundation that makes immersive technologies more immersive. That seems a little bit like a tautology, um, but we are basically moving toward a universe, not just with AR glasses and VR headsets, but in general, um, where devices and computers know where they exist in the physical world, they understand where they are in relation to other devices, and where they are in relation to you and me. Uh, I actually have written a paper with Coben's wife, Keegan, uh, who was on the morning panel um, for the Stanford Cyber Policy Center that goes into more about spatial computing. But I think spatial data is going to be a big deal. Again, uh, let's, put, let's put an emphasis on the fact that Apple launched the Vision Pro with the, with the buzzword, the era of spatial computing. Uh, so what does this, all this mapping data look like? Um, this is sort of a, a, a rough image of what the Apple Vision Pro sees, and as you can see, it's you know, it, it, look, it, it's a, really what the, what the device is ingesting is all this information. It's then sharing not the actual photo or video of the room, but all of this other stuff, a polygonal representation of the space. You see labels of objects. Um, that's the underlying spatial map. Um, another example from one of Magic Leap's early devices is, again, it's, it's doing a combination of all this sensor data to do object detection and recognition. It can see a chair with 95% confidence level, um, and it's using this to build uh, a map. Um, maps have a lot of utility across devices and platforms. Um, a major use case here is for co-located navigation. Uh, this is still really hard to do. Um, at, the, at the State of the Net conference a few weeks ago, I was talking to folks who previously worked at uh, you know, some of the ride-sharing companies, and really like trying to make it so that uh, a driver and a rider know where they are in physical space to each other can be really hard. I, I mean, you know, I went on a date the other, the other week, and we're, we're calling an Uber at the end of the night, and there's five different Ubers, and we're out in the middle of the street trying to check license plates. Um, spatial mapping can maybe make this a little bit easier. Um, companies are already working on their own bespoke mapping solutions, um, but the end goal here is for everyone to benefit from a vast digital twin of every square centimeter of our planet. Um, and so my argument has been uh, that whether we're talking about the GDPR, the Data Act, the DMA, whatever, uh, it seems like we ought to be giving users more access to their own maps. Um, if you're not convinced that access to and portability of spatial maps is potentially useful, I also present to you avatars. Avatars are not a new term. They were, they were again, referenced in Snow Crash, the, the novel that infamously came up with the metaverse, but avatars have been used in video games uh, and computer software for, for decades. Um, Avatars are incredibly important for immersive technology because they've been described as offering a new layer of representation and self-expression. Um, they fall on a range of visual spectrums. So we've got obviously stylized, cartoony avatars, a little bit more realistic too. On the far left, the photorealistic, computerized Mark Zuckerberg. Um, it's easy to sort of look at meta, but again, lots of companies are spending huge amounts of resources, compute, money, uh, to generate more realistic and more expressive avatars. Um, so, I mean, this goes way back. Uh, 2006, the Nintendo Wii launches with the Miis, um, sort of becomes a mini craze. Uh, if you need a definition, I've got some definitions of basically avatars are a computer-generated version of yourself. Um, but the problem is, uh, you know, even as platforms are asking users to identify with and even technically drive this avatar, the end goal here is to have a virtual representation of yourself, the access to these avatars is very, very limited. Um, I really don't mean to just pick on meta here, uh, it's unfortunate, but they do actually put themselves out there on portability. Uh, but I think they're, you know, a good example of a company that provides really good data portability for their apps, but not for their avatars. Um, when I, you know, tried to download my avatar from a quest, I was given this nice little 2D transparent PNG file. Um, 
Other companies, however, like Ready Player Me, uh, are actually working to build more interoperable avatar solutions. Uh, they even offer some degree of access and portability by leveraging what's known as the Graphics Library Transmission Format, or GLTF standard. Um, so, you know, this is Ready Player One interface, but they allow you to download your avatar and then I can upload it and here's, you know, Avatar Joe floating in virtual space to be changed and reclothed and reskinned. Um, so, you know, as I said, the scaffolding is here. We've got 3D file formats. We just need platforms uh, to make them more accessible to folks. And we need developers that are able to build tools to use these across devices uh, and services. So I, I mentioned GLTF, acronym city here. Um, that helps, uh, that provides a file format for sharing 3D objects and spaces. Um, this is a file form format spearheaded by the Kronos Group, which also runs the Metaverse Standards Forum, uh, which has been supported by over 2,000 different companies and organizations. Um, last fall, we have an industry consortium led by Adobe, Apple, NVIDIA uh, at the Linux Foundation to promote the development of the universal scene description technology. So we have the file formats, we just need the will. Um, so I probably don't need to convince this room of the potential benefits of portability. I think there's a huge number of portability benefits for maps. Um, I hope that there's obvious portability benefits for avatars, um, but even if the issues for sharing maps among developers isn't persuasive to you, I think it's also just giving users data that they are contributing and can have a lot of fun with. Um, so, you know, when it comes to avatars, I think back to, you know, Nintendo in 2007. They put out a game, Metroid Prime 3, and they had the little, like, me bobblehead in the game. And obviously this is Nintendo's own uh, solution in their own game. But when I think about the future of immersive technologies and these avatars, at minimum here, why can't I have my own little uh, avatar bobblehead sitting on my desk that I can see through my phone, through my Vision Pro, through my VR headset? Um, it's, not a, it's not a groundbreaking uh, use case. It's not solving world health. Um, but it is a lot of fun, uh, and it does seem like it goes directly to what we mean when we talk about giving people access to and portability over their data. Um, so that's my spiel, and thank you very much. I can use this one, yes. Um, I don't know whether there is questions or do we questions later on? Okay. Yeah, go right ahead. We'll have questions at the end. Okay, thank you. Um, well, first of all, uh, thanks to DTI for having me here. Uh, I'm a part-time academic, so I, I think I have the same issue that in the previous panels, I don't fully identify as an academic. Um, I come from business. I've been 15 years um, heading Microsoft's uh, responsible tech and competition team in Europe. Um, and dealing with a lot of the acronyms that we have already heard of um, this morning. Um, and here uh, I have proposed to Chris to, to think about um, something related to data portability and AI, AI since I've been working for the last seven years on AI policy in, in, in Europe. Um, so the idea was really to start with AI companions. This is like the most personal it can get. And I started from developing sort of the case scenario in the future uh, based on the film Her, where Theodore um, does um, sort of want to have a different type of uh, companion, different from Samantha, who got a little bit um, maybe too emotional at times. Um, and so he wants to shift that. So he has a conversation with Samantha and um, they decide that it will be better to move on. So like a, a nice divorce, uh, amicable divorce. Um, and so they transfer the data to Saif. Um, so what, what could this data be? It's like the personal preferences, the prompts theater has put in. The, the recommendations he, he was uh, getting from Samantha inferred insights that she had based on his conversation, the training data, uh, the fine-tuned data that, that uh, they, they, they uh, worked on, the, inter the interaction with other agents, uh, including wearables. Um, 
And last but not least, the prompts and eventually even the outputs leaving IP rights aside for a second. <laughs> so this is sort of the idea behind. Um, but when looking at this, um, it, it became clear that we need to start thinking about uh, what's actually happening in the AI space. So I was looking a little bit in, in, in the area of autonomous AI agents. That is sort of what's happening currently and how is the overall ecosystem in um, evolving. Um, we've seen with uh, ChatGPT a couple of primer, smaller autonomous AI agents, so baby AI, for example, mostly happening on GitHub, mostly on the open, open source theme. Um, generally, um, the um, autonomous agents, there's actually a little bit of um, uh, there's not yet a definition, but um, that's sort of the overall issue with AI, right? Autonomous AI agents are not clearly defined yet, but they have sort of components that are relevant. Memories, for example, one, um, metacognition, the, these are essential capabilities, external data sources, automation of web browsers for task execution, and the ability to interact with tools in order to uh, actually execute some of the commands uh, independently. So these are sort of the, the, the most important elements of autonomous AI schemes as they are currently described. Um, it's also interesting to note that because of that, there is an assumption that uh, these autonomous AI agents are going to replace search and they are going to replace apps over the next couple of years uh, so that we will have a more, uh, more data concentration eventually as well. So the, the assumption that they will replace uh, word process spreadsheets, uh, search advertising, social networking, etc., comes basically from the fact that we are more and more moving towards uh, an interaction that is based on converse, conversational um, uh, interfaces. Um, that again then will, will, will require us to look a little bit at the market ecosystem of AI agents. Um, and currently we see tons of different applications, right, and a number of different areas in which uh, general uh, and personal assistance or other tools, other agents are developing. And it's not quite clear yet how this is going to move forward. In fact, when you look at trying to find um, information around how this market will look like in a year or so, you really have to go into sort of geeky web pages that um, look a little bit in or venture capital uh, web pages that, that start to look a little bit into this. Uh, but largely um, what we are seeing is that um, the, the um, AIs that we currently know, they become the platforms of tomorrow. So um, that we are seeing another stack in the tech stack with, um, in addition to the compute being the platform, uh, having AI as the platform on which the applications are developed. Um, and I'm saying all of that because um, that is relevant in the context of the current data portability rights. And I'm looking specifically, of course, uh, to the European Union here. So the new, um, the new applications will be these agent operations applications. And then eventually there will be also services that uh, bring these autonomous AI agents together. Um, important in this context eventually as well, and it's just made a little side note, is how we think about general intelligence um, and whether there will be a creation or concentration coming once we have achieved super intelligence or artificial general intelligence. Again, it's a debate that is related to interoperability and data portability, but maybe not the super focus of this discussion. And another important side note uh, is uh, the discussion around open versus closed AI agents. So uh, a lot of discussion, I don't know how much people here in the audience are aware of this in the context of AI safety is 
about um, open models being more risky and unsafe. And this um, obviously has an impact also on the agent level. Um, although, um, what I've seen in the research is that when you look at the AI agent landscape, you actually have uh, more or less as many open source AI agent developed as you have closed sources uh, AI agents developed. And on the open source AI agents landscape, um, that, is, that is where you have currently uh, interoperability projects actually happening. So the, in, on, on GitHub, do you find tools and, and projects that really try to make these a autonomous AI agents um, interoperable? And the reason, of course, is if you really want to have an AI agent, autonomous AI agent landscape, you need them to be able to communicate with each other. So it's no longer that the person needs to communicate like on the telephone, but it's the AI agents that needs to communicate with the other AI agents. So in this space, um, we have like a very close relation between the uh, data portability and the interoperability. And of course, this is all nascent. These platforms are just starting. Uh, but it's interesting to look already now in how this translates into um, the rights under EU law. So we've heard already this morning uh, a lot about GDPR. And when you think about AI companions in particular, it's very personal. It's also the first restriction. Uh, GDPR only applies to personal data. And it's all, all also not, it's not applicable to, to, to legal uh, entities. Um, it has been introduced with the GDPRs and the previous uh, preceding General Data Protection Directive. This right of data portability doesn't, didn't exist. The data access right did so. And the reason was really more uh, a, a, a conversion versus ownership. Not quite right ownership, but really this control. It was really focused on on, on giving data subjects control over their data. Now, we've already heard, of course, as well, uh, why uh, there are restrictions. One that I didn't hear this morning is there are several legal, um, um, uh, uh, legal grounds for processing data, but the data portability right only um, uh, is, is uh, accessible or possible. Uh, when you have a contract or consent, not when it is a legal obligation or public interest. So there's restrictions to under which circumstances the data portability right ex uh, exists. Um, then we heard, uh, and I think that is sort of the key issue or two of the key issues why it is limited, that there is no monetary obligation for the uh, controllers of the data to de develop technical solutions. And this obviously has made it almost less, less applicable at the moment, at least. Um, more importantly, in the context of an AI companion is the restriction to what type of data. Uh, so it is only for data provided uh, by the data subject or observed. Um, so um, the, the data around, for example, raw data in the context of the use of, of a specific tool, yes. But the inferred data that can be, so the profiling of a person, uh, that would not be included. And that is sort of one of the core uh, limitations of the GDPR. In 2020, the, the commission did the first assessment of GDPR and had noted that uh, it has not reached its potential. And IAPP uh, has done a survey in 2022 uh, where it also came to the conclusion that other, uh, that the data portability has seldom be exercised. There's almost no case law on data portability and certainly no ECJ uh, case law uh, on uh, data portability. Now, very quickly on the DMA, it's um, obviously, as we heard this morning as well, um, it is uh, coming in applicable only next month. It's in, in force since last year, so the, the, the respective gatekeeper companies have been engaged with the Commission since a year on the services that were to be uh, designated. Uh, 
uh, and those where the companies have issued rebuttals in order not to be designated. Um, the DMA, as we heard as well, is not really focused on the data subject right, but on fairness and contestability in the market. And here, um, uh, it is important to note it's not only personal data, and it's not only people, but also legal uh, entities that have the ability to request data portability. So it's broader, uh, but more limited in, in scope uh, as to the gatekeepers. Um, what is important, um, currently we have a number of gatekeeper services designated um, or core service core platform services designated as gatekeepers. Um, and these are the operating systems, as it, three operating systems, two web browsers for social networks, three online advertising services, one share, video sharing um, platform, six intermediation platforms, um, and uh, a couple of services have been exempted, iMessenger, Bing, Edge, and Microsoft Advertising. Why is this important? Because virtual assistants are also identified at, as, ten, uh, as one of the 10 distinct core services, um, but none has been actually designated. What I think happened is that the commission had like a Siri or um, uh, Siri, uh, for example, in, in mind when they um, included virtual assistants. But now the question is, does this new landscape of autonomous AI agents actually, can, be, can it be captured in the context of the DMA? And that's much more difficult to say. Currently, the commission has not looked at it yet. It certainly has not identified I, one of the um, uh, most dominant virtual assistants, um, and it has not yet identified, for example, one of the AI platforms as a platform per se, and it was a question mark whether it would actually be part of one of the core service platforms. So as it, as it stands for the scenario that I have described, the DMA also fails to deliver specifically for the scenario. Um, at the same time, what is interesting or could be interesting is looking at um, search, because of course search is currently changing. Uh, Google search is a core service platform, so understanding in how Google will comply uh, might give us some insights into whether there is actually such a right to data portability in this in this, in this space. Um, so I think with the DMA, there is a lot of opportunity still, and it really depends on how it will actually be deployed. And I think we heard a lot about this already tomorrow. So my last, the last point really is the Data Act. We haven't heard much about the Data Act this morning. It's um, a law that um, has if you think about GDPR, data control, um, DMA, competition, data act is sort of the availability of data, which is really what is the core idea behind it. And then we have, there are some others, of course, as well. Um, here, um, this law will only be applicable in uh, September next year. So there's a lot of time still uh, until we actually see how the implementation is going to be allowed. And then the, 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 the core piece here, so I will wrap up a little bit quicker, um, is that again, virtual assistants are part of, um, of the data act, specifically mentioned. But one of the core limitations uh, to the virtual assistants is that it only applies if the virtual assistant is part of a product. So again, you have Siri um, in a product, then the data related to this, but not the content data would fall under the right uh, of access to uh, under the data act. So it's not a specifically a data portability right, but it's a right to access that enables the, uh, the, the portability from one service to another. So uh, here we have, a, it's, it's more a competition related right, but portability is specifically mentioned under the Data Act. So 
To conclude, when you look at a specific case under those three broad data portability rights under the EU law, under the EU uh, legal framework, uh, you can see that there is a disconnect between those. They, they've been adopted at different times with different um, objectives in mind. There might actually even be a, a little bit tension amongst them. Um, so ideally at one point um, there is a little bit of a consolidation happening, so a data portability focus uh, would be important. I generally believe that today, um, and that is certainly different from telecom laws 20 years ago, you need to always have a co-regulatory system. So when you look at the newer laws and in the EU, such as the data, the AI Act, and the DSA, they have co-regulatory co approaches that help to develop uh, more technical implementations uh, with the support of the companies. Um, and now something that people might not want to hear yet, but uh, I'm pretty convinced that the GDPR is soon ripe for re revision and the calls in Brussels are becoming louder that a revision might actually happen. And then this could be an a, a, a important opportunity to concentrate this data portability right really more on a more human-centric um, approach for cases where it really matters and applying those with a co-regulatory flexibility to allow companies to actually implement it uh, according to the technologies. And that's it. <laughs> Hello. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm Chandra Gendra Nicolucci. Um, yeah, that's me. Uh, I am a researcher at the Initiative for Digital Public Infrastructure. Uh, I also lead our product efforts there. Um, which has sort of um, brought me into this topic that I ended up writing about. Um, we're building an app called Gobo, which is uh, essentially a social media aggregator. Our motto is all your social media in one place, uh, which is false advertising because we very much fall short of that uh, because most of the major platforms do not uh, support porting your data, your social media data um, to an external uh, client like ours, uh, but we do support Blue Sky, Mastodon, and Reddit, and if you're interested in trying it out, please send me an email. Um, but yeah, I was excited to write about this topic because I think uh, requirements for continuous and real-time portability um, really hold a lot of potential to deliver on data portability's promise of empowering users and competition. I think that the way that portability has been defined and implemented up until now has fallen short of that promise in a lot of ways and that requirements for continuous and real-time portability can get us a lot closer uh, to those goals. Um, I'll just be quick about covering that because uh, that's not what my paper's about. It's not to convince you that continuous and real-time is a good idea. I just think it suffices to say that it will make it much easier to build useful services on top of ported data. Um, but in terms of what it would actually look like to implement continuous and real-time portability at any sort of real scale uh, in practice, um, you can think about at a high level basically two models, uh, a pull-based model and a push-based model. So in a pull-based model, um, your portability lifecycle would start with a recipient service, uh, which is a service that a user is trying to port data to. Um, and that recipient service would go to a source service, which is the service that a user is trying to port data from, and it would grab all of the data for a user uh, up until that point um, and, and bring it over to the recipient service so they're up to date with whatever data the user has up until that point. And then to continuously port users' data in real time, a, source, uh, a recipient service in a 
uh, pull-based model would enter a request cycle with a source service where basically almost constantly they are asking the source service, do you have any updates? Do you have any updates? Do you have any updates? Um, and occasionally the source service will say, yep, I have an update uh, for the, the user's data. Here's that update. And then the recipient service can sort of reflect that and uh, do whatever they want uh, based on that update. Um, on the other hand, in a push-based model, uh, things start off very similarly. A recipient service grabs all the user's data that uh, has been uh, created up to that point in a source service. But once you get to the continuous and real-time part of it, uh, things sort of flip. Uh, so here in a push-based model, a source service um, will notify all the recipient services when a user's data has been updated. So instead of recipient services having to constantly ask a source service if there are any updates, the source service simply, as a user's data is updated, goes out and notifies uh, all the recipients that an update has been made. And so this is nice because it's much more efficient than a pull-based model. Um, pull-based models end up um, incurring a lot of unnecessary requests because a lot of the time when a recipient service is asking a source service if there are any updates, uh, there aren't any updates, and uh, running that constant cycle of requests proves to be pretty resource intensive and burdensome uh, for all the services involved. And so implementing continuous real-time portability with a pull-based model would be impractical uh, for a variety of different services and uh, at any sort of large scale. Whereas with a push-based model, you get rid of all those unnecessary requests. Um, you're just uh, updating recipients as the updates are being made in the source. And it makes it much more realistic to implement continuous and real-time portability across a lot of different services. And so I end up advocating for a push-based model in my paper, uh, specifically um, a form of push-based data transfer called webhooks, um, which are basically push-based data transfers over HTTP, which is the protocol that underlies the web. Um, this is a, webhooks are a fairly common and well-known pattern in the software industry. If you ask any web developer what they are or how they work, uh, they're gonna be able to give you a decent overview of it. Um, they're especially popular among enterprise software providers like Stripe and Shopify. They form the backbone um, of a lot of their infrastructure. And in addition to the, having the advantages of being efficient and well understood, uh, webhooks are nice because they're pretty flexible. Um, they don't impose um, many constraints on uh, the data format that services are using to port data. Um, because it's based on the web, you can pretty much provide data in whatever format is web compatible, uh, in pretty much any format as long as it's web compatible. Um, and this is nice because um, in particular, it avoids having to use shared data formats when you're porting data. Um, and shared data formats are useful sometimes, but a lot of the times they are burdensome, they're difficult to negotiate, uh, they're difficult to translate to and from. And, um, the fact that webhooks can work without them is a really nice uh, benefit. Um, essentially, webhooks just uh, are implemented as an extension of a services API. Uh, so they can just provide the data however they're providing their data through their APIs. And then uh, recipient services uh, who want to uh, port users' data from a source service can just integrate uh, with a webhook like they would integrate with any sort of API. Um, so. Those three reasons, uh, that it's well understood, that it's efficient, and that um, it's fairly flexible, um, make me think that webhooks are a pretty promising model for implementing continuous and real-time portability. Um, there are some contexts where it's not a great fit. So um, when you're dealing with high volumes of data that um, have time restrictions, like if you're trying to port uh, financial market data and you need quotes like to the millisecond, uh, webhooks probably aren't a great solution. But for the vast majority of use cases, webhooks uh, work really well um, and they work really well at large scales with uh, pretty quick um, transaction speeds. Um, and this is shown by their use uh, in companies like Stripe and Shopify who deal with uh, hundreds of millions of transactions uh, every day. Um, in addition to uh, sort of that qualifier about um, volume and speed, uh, there's 
a bunch of challenges related to reliability and security, which are worth um, flagging. Um, I go into much more detail in the paper about these various challenges, but I'll just flag one to give you a sense of kind of um, how, uh, how to think about these. Um, and so one security challenge is authorization. So how do you know that uh, as a source service that a recipient service is allowed to access a user's data? Uh, this is like a pretty basic problem that you need to solve to do webhooks uh, well at, and reliably and securely. And um, we, we know the answer to this question. Um, you should probably use some sort of delegated authorization protocol, um, something like OAuth, which is what uh, you use when you sign into non-Google websites with Google. Um, but it's worth flagging because this is an additional complexity and nuance that is required to uh, implement webhooks uh, successfully, uh, reliably, and securely. And a lot of the challenges that I flag in the paper uh, basically uh, follow the same sort of script, which is um, they're important to acknowledge, but we know the answers to all of them. None of them are open research problems, and they're all tractable, which I think is um, very promising for webhooks as a model for continuous and real-time portability. Um, and in particular, a good way to sort of address a lot of these challenges would be through technical standardization uh, for webhooks. Um, Articulating a technical standard for webhooks that considers a lot of these challenges and um, through an expert body uh, outlines a formal recipe for how to go about implementing webhooks uh, successfully would be really helpful for um, a wide variety of services who are looking to implement webhooks, um, especially if uh, they become a model for continuous and real-time portability. Um, so overall, I think webhooks are a really promising approach to implementing continuous and real-time portability. I think they demonstrate that it's feasible to do uh, this at a pretty decent scale. And I think anybody who's excited about the evolution of portability um, into this next phase with continuous and real-time should be excited about webhooks as a possible uh, solution for that. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Um, I enjoyed reading all of your papers and encourage people who uh, have, haven't looked at them to be sure to take a look at them. Hopefully, uh, this has piqued your interest, too. Uh, if you haven't already, are there any questions? Hey, Ryan. Hi, uh, Ryan Biedish. I uh, work on the privacy policy team at Meta. Uh, I had a question, I think, primarily for Joe, but maybe also a little bit uh, on uh, the uh, AI-related question. Um, there, it seems, seems to me that, you know, the implicit in what you were talking about, Joe, is that there's like a timeliness issue, a timeliness challenge, maybe, that like, that there's sort of at least maybe three three factors that I can think of that come into play. Like one is the existence of, you know, appropriate uh, data formats, uh, which you talked a little bit about. Another, I think that's sort of closely related, is sort of uh, an understanding about like what the atomic element is that's portable. And this is something that like in my work uh, on data portability at, at Meta is actually something that's surprisingly, I think, um, uh, you know, not, not well understood uh, by, by folks. Like when we talk to policymakers, you know, oftentimes they express skepticism about data portability because they're like, oh, well, there's no real Facebook competitor. So what can you, you know, how do you port your Facebook data? And we have to explain, well, that's not the atomic element. You know, you can port your your photos and your videos and your posts and your notes, but that there's, there, there's, there's a sort of agreement that has to be reached about like, what is the thing that's, you know, that's portable. And then maybe the, the third piece is that there's like a, a value to, to users element, given that like, that, that the costs of developing and maybe even perhaps more importantly, the cost of ongoing maintenance for data portability tools, particularly at a large scale, can be non-trivial, that there is a sense that, you know, that there's often a need to prioritize, you know, when, you know, when, when do we build this and for what purposes? And so I guess the, the question that I have for you is, you know, it's like, uh, you know, I, you know, totally get that it would be nice not to 
to, or to, it would be nice to get something better than a transparent PNG of your avatar. But like, what are the factors that you would advise uh, in terms of like, when does it become sort of timely to actually build build that tool and to make it so you know uh, you know functional? Uh, so that that's a fantastic question, and I feel like I, I'm not I'm not I wouldn't be a great arbiter of that uh, in general. Um, I think your your criteria are are actually very useful here. Um, I think my my or at least the prompt for the paper, and I'll echo that again. I'd love for folks to just take a look at. I welcome feedback, good, bad, anywhere in between. Is that uh, my prompt was again? This comes directly from Meta, but it's not just Meta that we are going to build an open and interoperable metaverse. And then the second question is, what does that mean? And, and nobody has an answer to that. So let's at least try and build toward a portable metaverse. Um, and so I, I think you're right. And I would argue that the two data types that I identified, spatial mapping and avatars, um, meet all of your criteria. We've, we've got file formats. We have a, 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 gen, like a kernel of what the map is and what the avatar is. Um, and even though it's not entirely clear what the user value is at this moment, and I think that echoes the conversation we've been having all day, it's like, we, I think we're operating under the theory that if you build it, they will come, but we don't know that. Um, in this instance, if everybody's gonna go around and saying we wanna, these are, the, these are future technologies for what we envision as a embodied immersive internet, well, core elements of that are gonna be avatars and maps. So at some level, both of those things, I think, get swept into all of these regulatory regimes. Um, I, I give you props for mentioning the Data Act. I think the Data Act is exactly on point with respect to spatial maps already. Um, it, again, that's not, that's not about VR headsets. That's about autonomous vehicles, autonomous tractors, your Roomba. I mean, all of these are devices that are creating maps. Um, so again, that seems like it's already ripe. And then avatars are another example where we've already got all sorts of players building their avatars. Um, so if everybody's building toward open interoperable avatars, but yet all of the avatars are not portable um, and don't play nicely together already, that just seems like we're, we, are, we are walking down a, a, a road that's gonna lead to no portability anywhere. Um, so that's probably not a sufficient answer to your question, but I, 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 my more of our thesis is there's a lot of different data involved in immersive technologies, hence my, my slide. Um, but I, I, I zero in on these two things because I think that they're actually pretty mature. And I think this highlights a common theme that I got from all of your work, which is how use case dependent this is. And it's not just the use case of immersive tech. It's There's use cases within verticals and use cases within those. Um, and I, in, in my career, it's a career hazard that when people say, how, how do we... And they start a question like that. I know my answer starts with, it depends, <laughs> right? Questions? Other than how do we solve this? I can't, we can't take that one. Hi, everyone. Um, wonderful presentations, really informative. Um, the question I had was for Chan, um, actually. Um, well, one, of, one of the problems that um, I think webhooks, creating some kind of mechanism for portability is the standard, right? Um, and you, you had mentioned in your presentation um, that standardization seemed like a good option for um, creating a robust system for webhooks. I guess, I guess like, I guess I read the XKCD where it's like there's one standard and everyone, let's just create another standard, right? Like, if we, so if we just create another standard, I guess like, I guess the question, my question for you is like, how do you incentivize adoption? Like, who's creating the standard? Is it government? Right? Is it? Is it? Are they making it mandatory? Like, I guess, how do you how do you create the incentives to get adoption or to a sufficient mass where it becomes kind of widespread? That's my question for you. Yeah, for sure. I think it's a good question. Um, well, I think first, like, I don't think a standard is necessary to do this stuff. I mean, people use webhooks every day right now, and there's not really a widely adopted standard for them. Um, I do think it would be helpful if you were to see it become involved in things like continuous and real-time portability just because um, once it becomes part of like a formal, uh, when you're implementing a regulation or something, I do think um, standardization would help address a lot of those like security and reliability challenges that I think you see right now where there's, you know, 
20 different flavors of web hooks that for somebody who's coming in and maybe doesn't have like a lot of technical resources, um, they are way more likely to screw up their implementation of webhooks because there's not really a uh, widely accepted best practice and recipe for them to follow. Um, but I do agree that like, you know, standards are difficult to get right and um, are a, you know, bureaucratic uh, process. But I do think there's actually been a proposed webhook standard at the W3C. I don't think it's not been widely adopted yet, but I do think there is um, some potential there, but I don't think it's like the usefulness of the idea of webhooks for portability totally hinges on it either. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. A round of applause for our <laughs> guests.